How important is a birth and breastfeeding plan? Do you have one? I'm joined today with the one and only Dr. Robin and I'm Chelsea from Team Thompson and we're here to share five important factors that you could consider if you want to create a birth and breastfeeding plan. Hi Robin, how are you doing? Hi Chelsea, I'm doing okay. <laughs> Good and I'm very excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be sat alongside you virtually, so to speak. And me too. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's very exciting, isn't it? So, so Robin, I know that you wanted to um, just say a little, a little something before we get started. So, I, I just start when when I do uh, anything live like this. I start with what I call my disclaimer, and my disclaimer says that I, I actually, uh, you know, talk broadly because I can't talk about the unique woman because I'm not seeing her. I don't have a history. I don't know the detail. So it's and and I talk in a way that gives you some broad information, but keeping in mind that it may not suit every woman. So I'm always very precautious about women, you know, telling other women what to do or how to do it, or even midwives telling women what to do and how to do it, because most times women know. They actually have the answer most times, yes. That's so I cool. encourage instinctive knowledge to be, to, to, to work with. And, and so my, my disclaimer is not about disclaiming what I say, it's about sharing information on a broader context so that women can use what they choose to use from it if they choose to use it. Absolutely, and I only wish I had access to that knowledge in your brain. This time last year when I was giving birth to my son, it can be so overwhelming, all that conflicting advice, like you say, and we know it, we know it in our guts, what's the right answer. And the first thing that I ever experienced in that hospital after giving birth was you're doing it wrong. That's what I was told, you're doing it wrong. And when I finally got in contact with you, Robin, and you made me feel better, it's because I was finally listening to myself, not to anyone else. So thank you for very, that. Very, very important that women uh, have the knowledge. And so my, my role at this stage of my career and my life is to share knowledge, not to withhold knowledge or not to try and overwhelm with knowledge either. Yeah, yeah I feel that. I definitely feel that. I feel very empowered and, um, like I said, very privileged to be here with you today. So five important factors to consider if you choose to create a unique birth and breastfeeding plan. Do you consider breastfeeding when creating a plan? What, Robin, what do you think? Do you think that's often overlooked when women consider their birth? Yes, I do. I think, well, I, I'm not sure that it's been looked at as much as it is being looked at now with the women around the world that are actually uh, using uh, my template. So I don't have a plan for every woman, but I do have a template that gives shares knowledge with women. But the important thing about that is each country around the world too may have different laws. So if you're looking at the law of consent, for example, the law of consent is applicable to the particular country or the particular state or whatever it is that they're working in. So I have in the, in the template the, uh, the law Uh, believe that women have right well I don't believe I know women have rights and it's just really important particularly at this time when women are rising and speaking out to be sure that with childbirth with with pregnancy with labor with birth the tra beautiful transitions through that time to breastfeeding there is information that women can feel confident and safe with and that you know realizing that from time to time it may change and then the 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 uh, and we'll talk about that later what to do in in the expected emergency situations or unexpected emergency situations you know that's probably the better way to say it and uh and so there there are ways of going about things so yeah that's how how so pre preparation is key. Ultimately, um, you, you may not stick to the one plan you have uniquely created for yourself, but it's about having those options and having that knowledge in case things do go off track or like yeah. you said, unexpected or emergency situations do arise, which we will 
get into yeah. a little bit further. So what about let's let's get started with routine examinations, Robin. That's one thing I remember sourly from my experience personally. What would you like to say about that? Yeah, about routine vaginal examinations. Um, well, I have to say that in our in the education process, even when I went through it way back in, in the 70s, it was all about us knowing what was going on with the cervix, what how dilated it was and what was happening. But then my 25 years with women at home taught me a whole different perspective of being with the woman, actually being there quietly, maybe beside her, maybe, but not always right in her space, but clearly observing her body language, her facial expression, the sounds she was making. And then I realised that unless it was absolutely necessary and we both agreed or she requested it, I didn't need to do vaginal examinations. So for many births, I didn't do any vaginal examinations at all because I could actually interpret most of the time, not all of the time, nothing's ever perfect in this world, but most of the time I could interpret where she was and what she was doing. And, and there are significant changes that go on with each woman do, during that transition. And if we don't interfere there, then we can actually come to breastfeeding much easier because the baby's not uh, subjected to the opiates that the mother's often given with anaesthetics. So, you know, epidural, spinal and general anaesthetics is, is a big problem for little babies. It's a big problem, enough of a big problem for mothers when they're drowsy and they're not coordinating as well till that's all worn off. And, and it does have a big effect and we actually see it all the time with the way the baby's are behaving. So and I actually colleague. wish I'd known that during my birthing process and I wish I had included that in my birth plan that actually um, vaginal examinations weren't necessary and uh, although I did decide to say no after the second one it's quite shocking and maybe shocking for you it may not be to hear that in, in England in the UK we aren't actually admitted into the labour ward until they've done a vaginal examination and nine times out of ten from what I've heard is that people are sent home unless they're over a certain number although many including myself can jump quite high from being quite low and all of us are unique as you say so so what you're suggesting is to just consider vaginal examinations and whether you would like to have that as part of your your labor yes. your active labor or not which is really useful yes. to know yes and the other like it, it's a very important part of the female body so we need to have much more respect for what we choose to do if we think we have the right to do it we have to rethink that and the most important thing for me is to sit down and talk with you about consent because consent means that you understand why someone is is wanting to do this what are the benefits what are the risks what are the alternatives and what are your rights that's very important and and then in addition to that if you're being uh, prescribed medications or drugs what are the side effects we don't often get, be informed about that so I think it's it will be a challenge for some women but I think it's it gives them more strength more information to talk with their professionals and also to pre-plan with them so that the professionals are aware of the way you are thinking the other really important thing for me about any vaginal examination, all women in stirrups, now I don't talk about that as much now as I used to, but is that you need to know, and, and you may not always get this information, if a woman has been sexually abused or subjected to sexual you know, advances that she wasn't happy about, then we have a profound effect on her if we continue to do that. And for example, I have a colleague who uh, was rang me because she was in a situation where uh, the uh, registrar at that particular hospital, the, the not senior doctor, the, the next, you know, the under the registrar and the residents, the youngest one, and then and then what happens is they uh, they expect to um, be able to take over because the consultant's not there. So he was insisting that she be put in stirrups, and my friend didn't knew the history and had warned him and he and said no and then what happened was was really brilliant because the female obstetrician arrived and she told the registrar to go away and she talked with him later so <laughs> kind so of, I mean, 
basically it's good to know that we can say no hospital That's policy right. is not law we should That's know right. our rights and we can yeah. definitely challenge anything a professional yeah. says Just because they're a professional doesn't mean what they says go so oh no. i wish i'd known all of this if i knew what i knew now that that things would be very different from my birth experience yeah. put it that way and that's where it, this is where the sensitivity comes because you if you're talking with someone and you're seeing their expression and you're picking up on what they're saying and often when i do the q and a if i read the last sentence first every time <laughs> there's the answer and what the, what this woman is looking for or this mother is looking for is some reassurance and and it's, I would say 90% of the time when I'm talking with women, they already know that we just need to either give them some more information or reassure them and, and create this feeling that their instinct will never be wrong. Yeah. Never be wrong. Instinct is always right. So <laughs> no true. one knows you or your body or your baby like you do. No one. And there's so, very yeah. few people that have told me that in my very short time of motherhood. And I'm yeah. sure that many people watching will agree that that's not a very common thing to hear professionals say. No. And it's actually quite, it's quite moving. So yes. I will say on behalf of everyone, thank you for that, Robin, for that trust in our instincts. And actually, Robin's already said, um, Dr. Robin's already said a wealth of really useful information already. So just so that anyone knows watching, if you'd like access to the show notes, for what's being said today if you just comment hashtag mama love in the comments we'll make sure you get access to those um i'll stop with the boring bit now <laughs> so robin how about you you likely touched upon it there but how about induction of labor how can that be incorporated into a unique birth and breastfeeding plan all right now what we're seeing or what i'm hearing from women women are actually speaking this at the moment and they're actually i have it in in records i have it in writing and in in verbal records as well is that they feel that a lot of the time they're being coerced and that what that done then does then is create fear and the adrenaline rises or the cortisol rises and then what happens is they're doubting themselves yet behind that their instinctive knowledge is saying oh i'm not sure i don't think so if that's happening with a woman, I encourage them to take time unless it's an urgent or emergency situation, then, then that's a different outlook altogether. But certainly with um, induction of labour, it's one of the highest interventions and the cesarean section rate follows on from that and that's increased phenomenally. So we are heading into an era where women are going into sickness hospitals to have babies and so a high percentage of those women, probably the World Health Organization talks about 10 to 15% will need assistance of some sort. But it's, it's a high percentage of women that are taken into the institution and then they end up with what is uh, talked about is cascading intervention. And the cascading intervention follows from one intervention for another, from another. So example, if you induce a labour and you rupture the fall waters, you're altering the hydraulic pressure around the baby. And the hydraulic pressure actually helps the baby descend. It buffers the baby. It's there for a reason, except if it, if it goes spontaneously and the, and the membranes break and the water comes spontaneously, that's the unique body and the unique mother and the new, unique baby talking about together internally what they need to do. And I think we, we, we bring in uh, these women into a sickness hospital so we then behave like they're sick. And so all of these things go on, whether they're timed in labour, they're expected to do, you know, their first, second and third stage within a certain time. All of these pressures are put on them. And I think if you take a step back, and I can say this confidently with experience, when you go into someone's home, you do not expect to put things that pressure them unless you are concerned and you talk with them about it if it's urgent or emergency you have a, a, an arrangement of transfer in place you have a buddy midwife who comes to help you and i've had buddy midwives right through my career and I, we buddy each other whenever that's necessary so i think we need to take a step back i think we need to look at why we're inducing all these labors is it for the benefit of the woman and the baby or is it the benefit of the institution and the medical people 
why do they want to get these women in through and out so rapidly? That's the question. Why? And you do often talk about the the system, the hospital system and how it's a process. And I absolutely found that I felt very processed, almost like cattle when I That's gave birth it. to my son. And I I so wish I had had that, that home birth that I wanted. And we will talk about that next week. We'll be talking about her home birth options. But you yes. want us to consider and ask questions. Why are you suggesting I need an induction of labour? Yes. Is it what I want? And can I be prepared if I choose to have induction? That's what you're asking women to just consider yes. a little bit more when coming to their creating their birth yes. and breastfeeding plan or just when they can communicate with their professionals. Yes. And if I choose at this point, because we know dynamics happen, things change. But if I choose at this time while I'm talking with you that I don't choose to have an induction of labour, please hear me. Please be patient. I will listen to you. I will participate with you, but I may make decisions that we can talk about. So it's not about taking over. It's not about, you know, telling them what to do, when to do it, how to do it. But it's about a reasonable negotiation. And, you know, it has to be reasonable. And also it has to have consideration for the professional too, because there's a lot of anxiety in, in that aspect as well if you don't agree. So the anxiety and sometimes frustration and anger, you know, but, but it's it's about women's knowledge. And I think it's the right time now to start considering how we respect women's knowledge, how we go about providing the services that we do. I would say preferably with my experience now out of a system, unless you really need to be there. You know, let's, and, and it was in my uh, midwifery days that, they in in Australia they took women from the small institutions or the small birthplaces in the community, and they um, put them into the big hospitals. And that now is a consequence of why the hospitals are so booked, yeah. so full. Yeah. You know, and then that back pressures onto the staff. So the systemisation of women, the systemisation of of uh, that, that professionals apply ends up in victimisation. So I do have a presentation on that. I do a presentation on that. So I'd love it's, to watch that. Just, it's, it's so very yeah. true, Dr. Robin, because the night I gave birth, I went in and they didn't have a room for me. They didn't have space for me. I was having to actively labour in a room where, where the supplies were kept. And I really wish I'd stayed at home because I, I, I recognise from your prenatal sessions how my stress level was just shot through the roof and the pain become, it become a lot more intense and you know, I wasn't in the comfort of my home. I didn't have my comfortable yoga ball to labor on. You know, I noticed a recognizable difference as soon as I was taken out of my comfort zone. And I was put in a, a very busy, sterile and o overused um, system. It's exactly what mm. happened to me. And it's so true. And I wish I'd had access to that template that you mentioned, those birth and breastfeeding plan templates, along with the prenatal sessions you have in the club would have been hugely useful to me, as I'm sure they would be to many women that are watching now. And, and if you are watching and you're a bit curious and you'd like to know more about it, let us know. Um, to share some Easter love, there is a little 40% uh, special offer along the weekend. And um, although you may want to know more, just, just give us a shout, just say yes, please, down below, and we'll get the details over to you. I cannot stress how amazing the prenatal sessions are. Robin added them in, in within the time of need during COVID when many women were, were not able to attend their prenatal classes, the antenatal classes. And I can't imagine how stressful that must be and how overwhelming it is normally under normal circumstances. I can't imagine mm. what that's like for women out there. So we stand together in solidarity. It's, it's not easy. So, Robin, tell me about the emergency and unexpected situations you mentioned. How can we incorporate that into our unique plans? Well, it is it is a, in the template, and and are we talking about urgent or non urgent? Non urgent. I think I think we could cover all generally non urgent. I think if we go if we go with the urgent first, with the active labour part, and we can talk about the first breastfeed after. Um, well, the non-urgent is is where you know is there a, you need to ask the question is there really a need to do this now? No, um, and the, one of the most important things is when you're considering all this is are you placing a woman on her back? Because if you're placing a labouring woman on her back, then she's already 
impeding the progress of her baby through her pelvis because the sacrum can't rise. So that's one of the biggest things that I learned from home as well, watching women, what they did, what positions they put themselves in to get the best benefit of the descent of their baby. And I have photographs of the sacrum rising and it's just beautiful. It's just doing its bit because the ligaments are soft and they're softened up and they... and the, It and makes the sense whole, to let gravity play its part. Yeah, and the hips, the hips rise and it just gives uh, diameters. It gives angles, it improves the diameters, improves the angles and improves the descent with the baby because the hydraulic pressure is guiding the baby down as well. So the uterus is contracting and retracting. So it's a whole process within the female body that does that. It's just brilliant. It's and so, yeah, so, so the non-urgent um, and routine procedures, well, I say probably more so the routine procedures are the biggest problem where we you know we get stuck in into a situation where it's routine rather than and then that non-urgent can become an urgent situation that that can create that situation and then also with all of that there's also the unexpected things that occur so you know say i'll give you an example say the baby's descending really well and then suddenly there's a a dip in the baby's heart rate. So now watch, we're listening. I actually don't use the monitors. I actually listen and watch the doctor. There's a dip. And if it's happening at the peak of a contraction and it's happening regularly, then I'm saying, ah, there's cord compression somewhere. So when we have that knowledge and we learn all of that, then we can learn about changing positions. We can learn about, is this urgent? Is this an emergency situation? And if it is, then we have to work with the emergency situation. If a woman, is in an urgent or it's more in an emergency situation where she can't make decisions for herself then the senior not the junior but the senior obstetrician then makes the decisions and so then the team working with the senior obstetricians follows the lead from 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 the senior obstetrician and i think all women with this template go in with that understanding that there may be an unexpected or there may be even a knowledgeable situation where you, you're having a time to see how things go but you know that something may not reach where you want to go so you can make those decisions along the way um, i think i think it's about encouragement it's about learning for us to speak with professionals, professionals to speak with us. You know, it's all it's all about sharing our knowledge and our information, but not frightening people, not coercing them by maybe because, you know, everybody should be induced at 39 weeks. Well, has that little baby reached gestational maturity at 39 weeks? It may not have. Maybe it has. Um, for example, I've had some little uh, 35, 36 weekers that have been 1.8 kilos and they've breastfed beautifully. Yeah. So uh, that's because I'm side by side with the woman. I'm not, you know, running around looking after many women. I'm not leaving her at prime times. And I think all of those considerations need to be reviewed. We need to review what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it, when we're doing it, and always first consideration is the woman and her baby and her knowledge as well, including her knowledge and her team's knowledge. So whoever she has with her as her advocate, that they are involved as well. They're not excluded. Uh, they need to be involved. And I know this this um, COVID um, virus has, has created problems for a lot of people, but I think we've been sometimes a bit over the top with that when it comes to a woman giving birth to her baby, preferably in these times, it would be better to give birth to your baby in your own home away from all of that. Yeah, I have seen that rates in the UK have risen for home births in some areas and that's completely understandable, yeah. especially as my one of my very close friends is pregnant. She is 36 weeks currently and she has been told so much conflicting advice as to whether she will have her birthing partner in the room with her or not. And, you know, like I said before, it's already scary enough for women generally having a first their first baby having giving mm. birth, you know, having she has some health complications as well. And then having being told that you're going to be doing it alone in the system, it, it must be terrifying, yeah. you know. So that, that, that video that you have uh, for our club members, where, that you, where you talk about partner involvement or family involvement, where yes. they are your advocates, it's mm. so important because, you know, mm. 
you might not be in, in a good state of mind. You're going to be in pain. You, you may not, you may have fallen asleep when a decision needs to be made. Mm -hmm. You're just not sure where it's going to go. So like mm -hmm. you said, being prepared, having that plan template to create it for yourself and, and communicating your wishes, which may change. That's, yes. that's key to, to being prepared. And obviously having the, the, the thought of breastfeeding as well, which is if it's in your ultimate goal, being, mm. uh, like you said, being aware of the effects of certain choices you mm -hmm. make is, is also right. really important. And that's actually going to be my next question, Robin, yeah. is how much should we consider breastfeeding with the birth plan? What is the breastfeeding aspect, aspect about? Well, from my point of view and from my research, um, and that's clearly from uh, statistical evidence, right? But I just go back one step and say that the research coming out at the moment is showing that if a woman has her, uh, her own midwife, so we should be aiming for every woman to have her own midwife, regardless whether she's public or private, her own chosen midwife, that is making a difference to the intervention rate. But coming back to breastfeeding, if... if um, it depends on what the woman wants, but if she wants her baby with her, I encourage that she has rights to to ask for her baby to be with her from the moment of birth. It should not be with someone else. We are the only mammals on the planet that give up our babies to someone else. And if we're giving up our baby for routine procedures because boxes have to be ticked, <laughs> yes. then that's inappropriate. A baby must be with its mother because it's just be, been born its its smell, its sensory skills are alive and well, and it's knowing how safe it is when it's with its mother. And, you know, not all babies go straight to the breast, but I talk about the three golden hours based on it takes time. And so the baby does its whatever it needs to do. It's just so, you know, secure. APGAR score of seven or above means the baby should be with its mother. If a baby does need help or resuscitation, it's usually with a baby with an APGAR score of less than seven. And sometimes it's, it's not long, sometimes it might be depending on the individual unique circumstances. But certainly, um, all of, if a mother understands the APGAR score too, because I get so many writing their, their beautiful, beautiful history for me and they've not been told, they don't understand it. Almost, oh, if we did some stats on that, we would see a huge... That would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I agree. So, and, and actually, it's not something that's discussed in the lead up to labour either. I was never <laughs> taught it. I found that out in my own research. I'm quite a curious mm. person. So I did... Mm. I thought I was prepared and I thought I knew all that could be learned for a mother heading into her first labor. But I think that what's what's the most shocking thing is that um, women women have this misconception. I, I don't know if you would agree that if if they if they have, you know, opiates or C-section or other um, planned interventions because they're necessary or they choose to within their rights, that some of them think that they weren't, they're not able to breastfeed. And, and recently we spoke to women about this mm -hmm. and um, many have successfully breastfed after these interventions. Yeah. And I think you'll agree that it's about being prepared and it's about having that knowledge. Like you say, yeah. the skin to skin, such a beautiful first cuddle. It may not be within those first three hours, but you would encourage it anyway. Yes, and even with, uh, you know, little babies that are a good APGAR score, even if their gestation is, is, is less, they can still do very well. Once a mother's separated from her baby, that's when the, the breastfeeding complications are actually statistically significant. Uh, we separate or we, we interrupt or we, we interfere with, with the mother and the baby at that time. It's, and the baby will take, in my experience, again, I have to talk about my experience because in my experience, a baby, you know, by the time it does what it needs to do, it can be up to an hour before it's even interested in going to the breast by itself. And you can feel the baby and you can see the baby using its small brain, its craniocervical spine and all the skills that come with smell, taste and touch, all those beautiful, beautifully highly sensitive mammal skills and it actually does slowly gently make its way to the breast and so not everybody 100 percent, and especially babies affected by opiates may be not as coordinated not able to do it as well and especially the mother who has a baby who's affected by opiates and she finds herself in a blur she may not be able to work with her baby in that way either but most importantly that first three hours uninterrupted 
And then I would encourage as many midwives that are with women to not to interrupt or do things that are routine procedures that are not urgent, that are not emergencies, that are for ticking boxes to be done to any baby unless it's absolutely necessary. Would you, would you be able to give an example of what one of those routine procedures are? A few come to mind, but I'd love you to share. Yeah, so weighing, measuring, um, you know, and if a mother wants to know her baby's weight, bring the scales in and let the partner do that and set the scales up for them and let the partner do it. And do we, the question is, do we really need to know all of these things right at this moment? So again, it depends on the unique couple, what their plan is and what they, uh, what they are choosing for, for themselves and us respecting that that they don't need to do all these routine procedures. So they're probably the most common and then they'll probably do the newborn assessment. But again, if you've got an active baby with a good APGAR score, you've got a baby that's a good colour and, and all the other things we look at, the baby's lips are a good colour the, or, and, and, you know, the baby's breathing well, then we don't need to be interrupting to do those things. We just need to learn to take a step back and just watch carefully, observe carefully, don't go away just let let it all unfold because this is a special event for the people that have are involved with this little baby it's their special event it's not ours it's not ours at all it's ours ours is a privilege to be with them it's a real privilege to be with them and if we start taking that on board rather than you know fearing everything and and uh, putting pressure on women and when the women use the word coerce, they feel like they've been coerced into it. So again, I'm not saying don't do anything. What I'm saying is just take into consideration in the moment what's happening. Is it urgent? Is it not urgent? And if it's not urgent or it's not an emergency, take a step back and you'll learn so much more if you do that. Yeah. And, and, for and me, they know. I, I'm, I'm so happy that I had the confidence to say no yeah. to the weighing at the beginning. I was enjoying all those cuddles. I'd waited nine months to meet my baby boy with struggle to fall pregnant as well, as I'm sure many women can relate. And I just mm. wanted to smell him. I wanted to feel him. And he, he was quite happy. He was quite content. We'd come out of the water and we'd lay down in bed. And, you know, daddy didn't even have a cold for the first few hours, a cuddle for the first few hours. I was just so content. And, and he was able to communicate with the baby as well. The first breastfeed happened. And I said, no, you do not need to weigh my son right now. And of course, if you're curious, go ahead and let them weigh. But like you said, Dr. Robin, let them bring the scales into the room. I think I would have been petrified if anyone had taken my baby away. It's a scary time. Yeah, we've had incidences where the mother's gone to have a shower and she's left baby with dad, partner, oh, and partner gets pressured and they take the baby off the partner. And so, again, that's where the partner needs the strength too, to be able to support and to continue that support. Look, there are, in my database at the moment is enormous with a whole range of things. And I feel very privileged that, you know, it, it, we can use that. We don't have to identify people. We, we de-identify and, co and, and code, but also if, if someone has given us consent, we, we do look at what that story is and we give it back to them once it's become the edited version for them to give written consent on whether they want to share that as well. So it becomes information sharing, not rather than inf education. And the information sharing interplays with what we're seeing what we learn from looking, seeing. And again, we're using our skills, sensory skills as well. We're using our knowledge, we're using our experience, and we're using the wisdom that we're growing from all of that too. So that's all part of my PhD really, because experience, knowledge, and wisdom are very important to, you know, gaining the confidence that we need to gain as well to go to where we need to go. Exactly. So, and, and many people may not know, actually, Dr. Robin, that you you based your entire, the entire method is based upon 45 plus years of experience working so closely with these mothers and babies. But your, your yeah. evidence based methods are, are based upon real experiences. You've researched, yeah. you've studied, you, your PhD is, is socialized with pain free breastfeeding. You 
you have given so many women the opportunity to enjoy breastfeeding from day one because they have that education and knowledge is power. And actually mm -hmm. someone that's watching named Sarah, she's just said that she's not having any visitors for the first 35 hours. She told my partner that it's just it's just her and the baby for the first day and a half. She wants to enjoy that, that precious bundle on her own. And that's just beautiful that, that someone's made that decision in strength after watching this video. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a, it's a very, very special time. And it doesn't matter whether it's your first, second or third or thereafter baby, like one of my team who's had six babies. You know, I wonder who that is. Hello, <laughs> Kelly. We were, Kelly actually um, breastfed all five babies without any struggles and came to number six. And, and I'm sure she won't mind me saying this, that she did struggle. And I don't think she would uh, have been able to continue breastfeeding till now um, without, without Dr. Robin's methods and her expertise. Yes. And there are many women that have been in similar situations, either struggled previously or haven't struggled previously. Every baby is unique. I found that out since meeting so many women through this glorious community. We're all unique. Our babies are all unique and every situation is, is so different. And, mm. and, and Dr. Robin always, always makes sure we, we're aware of that. And, and that's another huge topic we need to cover one day is the marketing of tongue tie when it's actually phrenotomy. <laughs> Absolutely. My son, this is a great, this is a great end to the show, Robin. I was told my baby boy has a tongue tie because I was experiencing pain. Um, they said it's a minor posterior tongue tie, which still to this day means absolutely nothing to me because I didn't need to do anything about it. Um, Dr. Robin's education on positioning is, is just perfect. And we won't go into too much detail about attachment or latching, latching being a questionable word. Um, but that first breastfeed is, is so important um, and, and you can learn all about that. And like I said, guys, we're spreading some Easter love this weekend. And if you'd like to learn more about the incredible education and the reason I'm here is because I'm passionate. I've been I've been a lady that struggled and, and purchased this incredible program and it it saved my life. As cheesy as that may sound, it changed my life. And if you want to breastfeed, let us know below. Comment. Yes, please. And we will happily share that incredible 40% discount with you. And if you'd like to know whether it's going to be any help for you, let us know. Ask your questions. Just want to say a huge hello to everyone that's watching and um, listening to us today. It's a pleasure to have you. Robin, is there anything you'd like to add to our lovely viewers? You know I don't like this part. but No, you don't, yeah. do you? <laughs> Robin said I didn't like this part. <laughs> no. But also, I would like to thank everyone that's been online today and and uh and then then their sharing as well i really do appreciate it i we rachel and myself rachel's a midwife colleague of mine who i've known for some many years now with her three babies and uh she's now working with me and she's online and getting beautiful feedback from the women too or having beautiful feedback from the women and and so i'm very keen to uh to expand this, we're working on our academy at the moment and uh, with Charles Darwin University as well. So there's a lot going on, but none of this journey, I just have to say to everybody, none of this journey was ever planned. My whole journey has been an opportunity when it came up and that goes right back to my professors, my three guru Australian professors who guided me in this direction because they were very interested in what I was doing. And they still are there in the background always for me and they guide me still to this day. And so I thank them and then I thank my team. This team now is new to, is a whole new perspective on life for me. And I hopefully I'll keep going until the end of the cycle. <laughs> oh, I agree. And I can I can absolutely tell you, Dr. Robin, that your voice is as much in the background constantly for me and I'm sure the rest of the team, just as you explained for yourself. And I'm so very, very grateful that I stumbled upon your education. I know that you don't like us promoting it, but we have to because we're so, so proud of it and we're so incredibly happy that we found this education. The Thompson Method is not just a method, it's a movement. It's going to change people's lives and Dr. Robin's way of thinking will hopefully change the way that the system works. And I will say, if I am ever lucky considering enough to be pregnant, I will be having a home birth. And that <laughs> will be what we're talking about next week, Dr. Robin. I'm so excited to pick your brain with that topic. 
We will be back Can I just here. Can that with one thing? Yes, please. I just on just on the uh, 29th of March, my eldest grandson turned 28, and I flew to Japan to be his mama's midwife. And he was born at home in Japan and the Japanese Midwives Association accommodated me without even having to register there. It was just perfect. My second grandson was born in Melbourne and his Japanese grandmother came for that birth. Oh, that's so, so beautiful. I just want to you have up. the most incredible stories and I'm sure we, <laughs> we would all, I'd, I'd be able to listen to you for days. Dr. So, Robin, your stories are incredible and I'm very excited to hear more birthing stories. So make sure you bring those to the forefront till next week. I'm very excited. Thank you. Next, next Wednesday, uh, the 7th of April, we will be talking home birth options. And if you're considering a home birth, why not, why not join us? Um, you might have some questions. You might be a bit scared. Someone might have put you off. I know that I was definitely put off, regrettably. So we're back next Wednesday, like I said, Wednesday the 7th, to talk home birthing options, which I'm very excited about. So... Um, I'll end by saying, as Dr. Robin always taught me, that it's your body, your baby, your choice. And thank you for joining. Robin, would you like to would you like to say goodbye? And thank you to Louise, who's on my right hand side here, who's seen me through all the IT. <laughs> <laughs> Marie, who's in the distance. And so because that's something I can't do. Well, I wish I had Louise, I must admit. Louise, would you like to come and join me in the UK to help with IT oh, here? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's like a bunch. Of can get you there you go. You're always welcome. Yeah, actually, it's a good chance to say thank you to the entire team because we have yeah. an incredible team of volunteers that are just all super heroes the world. all over the world. You know, the UK and yeah. America, all across the world, in Europe as well. And we're very privileged to have an all-female team, which is super special. So thank you all so much, Robin. Thank you. It's been thank a pleasure. You. I'm very excited to see you again next week. And thank All you right. so much for everything you do. Thank you very much too. Thank you. Bye, guys. Take care. See you.